Okay, it's right on 12. So I think I, I get started. I'm Ed Levin, director of the Center on Addiction and Behavior Change here at Duke University, uh, part of uh, the uh, Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, and uh, welcome you to our seminar series. This is the third in our uh, fall semester seminar series, and uh, it's the first in a series of four uh, consecutive seminars where uh, um, we call it the, the Duke Nicotine Research Seminar Series, Interacting Brain Systems. So this actually follows up on a uh, uh, longstanding uh, symposium uh, uh, series that Jed Rose and I uh, put together for uh, 25 or more years. Uh, and uh, given um, COVID, that's kind of uh, fallen a bit by the wayside in terms of a uh, devoted day-long symposium that we had, but um, the tradition was each year we'd have a different uh, um, theme. And so we're carrying on that idea, but not all in one day, but four uh, of these uh, um, uh, seminars on uh, interacting brain systems. So certainly uh, the brain is an organ of communication and there's no um, final common pathway. That's really a kind of, a, I think, a, a dead end <laughs> in terms of that that's a concept that really uh, it's, it's a processes of, of, of integration which uh, contribute to uh, uh, addiction and, 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 and um, alleviating addiction. So it's important to understand these interacting brain systems, uh, not only in terms of nicotine and tobacco, uh, but also other uh, sorts of drug addictions. Um, so uh, before we get started, I wanted to look ahead a little bit. So continuing on on the uh, 29th, we're going to have uh, Britta Hahn from University of Maryland to speak about uh, uh, life beyond dopamine uh, and interacting systems that influence uh, dopamine systems. And then Edie London from UCLA on the 15th of October talking about the insula and its uh, relationship to the smoking related uh, cues. And then Paul Kinney coming in on the 20th uh, of October talking about his work with the septohabenular circuit and, uh, and nicotine. Uh, and then in the later part of the semester, we're going to be going on with some um, more local folks uh, from Duke University talking about our um, um, substance abuse uh, 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 prevention programs here and also um, from our sister institution here at the uh, in Durham, uh, Alex Marshall is going to talk about uh, uh, his work uh, with the neuroimmune response and uh, um, alcohol abuse uh, from North Carolina Central University. And um, uh, Andrew Hockey from, uh, um, um, uh, our, uh, from Duke University is going to talk about smoking risks, risks in, in, in development. And Connor O'Neill uh, about, uh, uh, again, substance abuse uh, treatment in adolescents. Uh, and then uh, Tyler, if you can put on the um, uh, symposium for next semester, we're, I'm putting together these uh, uh, next semester seminar schedule. So if anybody has any suggestions for speakers, there's still some slots available. So if you want to speak or someone else uh, you want to nominate to speak, uh, please uh, let me know, edlevin at duke.edu. Um, and then um, I just wanted to highlight, we're uh, putting on a, a, a symposium uh, together with the Tribe Prevention Group here in, in Durham. Um, Duke, Dibs, and uh, CABC Symposium February 22nd on Marijuana, Brain Science, and Community Impact of Risk Prevention with Legalization. So um, 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 stay tuned for that, and uh, there will be a day-long symposium, and uh, it'll, but it'll be virtual as, uh, as uh, we're going to be continuing in, in this format. So now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Meyer, who is Associate Professor in the Behavioral Neuroscience Area Head in the Department of Psychology at uh, the uh, University at Buffalo. And um, um, uh, Dr. Meyer earned his PhD at Oregon Health Sciences University and has uh, uh, been uh, at uh, Buffalo for the last decade or so. And his uh, area of research has to do with brains reward circuitry and appetitive stimuli and drug addiction and um, um, association with conditioned uh, reinforcement. So um, today he's going to talk about uh, his work with uh, uh, nicotine amplification of incentive value during operant and Pavlovian conditioning. Paul. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Levin. I am uh, sharing my screen. I'm hoping that you can see the main screen and not the yeah, that's fine. not the notes page. All right, let me get out my laser pointer. Okay, uh, so thanks for inviting me to 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 give a talk. Uh, I'm really ex excited to be here. Um, I, I saw uh, Dr. Rose a, a minute ago, uh, who doesn't I don't uh, we haven't ever met, but. Uh, um, 
your work and uh, Tony Cajula's work has had a big Im influence on how I think about nicotine. Um, so I'm really sort of honored to be in the same virtual space as you. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, we haven't met unless you count uh, me asking a question of you last time you were here to give a talk at the University of Buffalo. Anyways, uh, good to see you again. Um, and just to say thanks for the inspiration over the course of my career. Um, so uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is uh, some of the work that I've been looking at in terms of uh, measuring Q responsivity in, in animals, particularly in rats. And I'm going to show you the sort of handful of studies that I've done here and there looking at the effects of nicotine. Um, so uh, I do, I, I like to start off with thanking the people that I've been working with because I always forget at the end. The people here on the left are, are the folks that are gonna, that have done most of the data collection that I'm gonna be describing in the talk. Um, but I'm gonna show you some work from some of the genetic studies that I've been doing involving a collaboration with Abraham Palmer, who is a, a behavioral geneticist at UCSD uh, and Apoorva and Alex are people in his lab but we've also been working with Hao Chen, uh, who does nicotine self-administration work at, um, at University of Tennessee Health Sciences uh, Center in, uh, in Memphis, Leah Solberg Woods, who's at uh, Wake Forest, and then um, uh, people at the University of Michigan, Terry Robinson and Shelley Flegel, uh, who I used to work with before I got this job uh, as a postdoc. Um, so I'm gonna, thank them up front, uh, in addition to thanking all of you. What I'm going to be focused on today, though, is uh, talking about reward-associated cues. So reward-associated cues are important, as, I, as I'm sure you all know, is that they strongly motivate behavior. I'm going to talk about operational definitions later, but the key feature is that cues spur some form of motivated response. What's particularly interesting about cues um, is that throughout evolutionary history, cues are usually, were usually inherent to the rewards that they're associated with. Um, however, in modern environments and in the laboratory, you can separate out the cues from the rewards that they're associated with. So this sets, sets up situations where cues can drive motivation in the absence of the rewards that they're associated with, or in the case of drugs, in spite of the negative consequences that come along with reward delivery sometimes. However, this isn't specific to drugs. Advertising companies are well aware of this, the ability of cues to, uh, to spur motivational responses. These are important for other pathological uh, disorders, addiction-related disorders like gambling and pornography. These are all examples where cues are dissociated from their primary rewards and can instigate motivation even in the absence of those rewards. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about how uh, we study cues in the lab, but first to sort of set up a little bit of framework. Um, I am going to refer mostly to Pavlovian cues. So these are cues that are presented to the animals, not contingent on the animal's behavior, as I know you all know. Uh, we call them condition stimuli, and basically equating the word Q with condition stimuli. So when I say that, that's what I mean associated with some sort of reward. I'll talk about food rewards and nicotine uh, rewards in this talk. One property of cues is that they have predictive value. This is probably pretty obvious. They provide information about the unconditioned stimulus, about the reward. However, Cues can, they don't always, but they can also acquire incentive value. Um, there's another term that basically means the same thing. I'll use them interchangeably, incentive salience. There's subtle differences, but incentive value, incentive salience refers to the ability of these cues uh, to elicit approach, become reinforcing and energize motivated behavior. Um, and again, I'll talk about how we define this in the laboratory. Um, this does not always occur. Um, some individuals attribute incentive value to reward cues, some don't. Um, the, here's the slide <laughs> underlining that, that, cue point, uh, that key point. Um, there's enormous individual variation in terms of who attributes incentive value to the cues. Some of you may be, maybe I've instigated a motivational response by showing you the picture of the chocolate cake. 
or maybe you suddenly have a desire to go to the OTB and start betting on the horses. Hopefully I haven't uh, spurred any motivational uh, cravings for cocaine in any of you. Um, so here's the operational definitions that I promised. The three key properties of a cue that has acquired incentive value are that they are attractive, reinforcing, um, or uh, that they energize motivational actions. And each of these is associated with a set of particular paradigms that uh, we can use in the laboratory. So attractive means that uh, approach will be directed towards it. I'm gonna talk a lot about Pavlovian condition approach coming up, so I won't dwell on that here. Also, individuals will work for presentations of those cues, they're reinforcing or condition reinforcing, um, or they can energize uh, appetitive actions. I'm gonna talk about cue-induced reinstatement. Um, I won't be talking about Pavlovian instrumental transfer, but Pavlovian instrumental transfer is really sort of the gold standard of whether a cue has acquired incentive uh, value or not. Like I said, I'm gonna focus mostly on, um, on Pavlovian condition approach behavior. So we all know what Pavlov did. He conditioned an auditory stimulus with the delivery of a meat sauce. I do wanna point out though, that in Pavlov's experiments, he restrained them. So he had to restrain them because he was collecting saliva because uh, he was doing his physiological stuff that he got the Nobel Prize for. But in some of the people doing Pavlovian conditioning after him, in fact, one of his students, this guy named Zenner, who published back in 1937, had unrestrained dogs and measured uh, their response in Pavlovian conditioning. And if you look at his paper, he sort of uh, details some individual differences in the responses of these, of these dogs. Here he says that some dogs would have uh, an initial, gl initial glance at the bell. Zenner was using bells, um, followed by a constant fixation to the food pan. So they would orient to the bell and then go to the food pan. Uh, others exhibited a small but definite movement of approach towards the conditioned stimulus, followed by a backing up uh, uh, later of a uh, backing up later to a position to eat. So already back in the 30s, people are describing individual differences in incentive value as measured by approach um, uh, to the conditioned stimulus. That's a that's what we do in the lab now. That's what I've been doing for, I guess, about a decade. Uh, um, now looking at Pavlovian condition approach, this time in rats. Now it's important, I have to say this again and again, um, uh, that this is a Pavlovian paradigm. So the animal does not have to perform any response to get a food pellet. Um, so the, the setup is that there's a, a lever that's extended into the into the chamber. I'll show a video coming up uh, for eight seconds. Then after that eight seconds, a food pellet's delivered into the food magazine. So it's Pavlovian conditioning. The animals don't have to press the lever. That's just really important to remember. Um, really what they just have to do is just wait for the lever to come out, go back in, and then they can get their pellet. But the thing is, is they nobody does that. The animals will show these variable responses just like, well, not just like Zenner described, but analogous to what uh, Zenner described. So I have a video that uh, is, I think I have to get rid of my pointer first, hold on. I've been using my pointer anyways. Um, so I'm gonna show you these two uh, major Zenner-like uh, behaviors uh, in this video. Uh, there we go. So the first rat, uh, here you'll see the lever is going to extend into the chain uh, into the chamber, and it's out there for eight seconds. This rat we call a sign tracker because he's approaching the sign that the reward's coming. You see him interacting with it, and he's deflecting the lever. We can measure that, and then he retrieves his food pellet. This rat displays a different response that we call goal tracking. He notices the lever, but then goes straight to the food magazine and sort of digs around in there until the reward delivers. Lever retracts, then it gets his food pellet and eats it. So here it is again, in case you missed it the first time, uh, sign tracking on the left, goal tracking on the right. The point is, is the animals are both eliciting a condition response, but the nature of the condition response depends on whether they've attributed incentive value to the cue. Here's what the data look like. 
Uh, there's not much to see here, but lever context is on the y-axis here. Days of training is on the x-axis. And you can see that animals that we define as sign trackers increase their sign tracking. So it's not surprising that it goes up because we define them that way. Animals that are defined as goal trackers don't do that. If you look at goal tracking behavior, food cup contacts here, um, there's an electric eye in that food cup. And so we can measure every time the animal goes in. Uh, sign trackers start out goal tracking, but then as they spend more time sign tracking, uh, they uh, um, get my pointer back out again. Uh, they reduce the amount of time they spend goal tracking. Whereas goal trackers, of course, as we've defined them, increase their goal tracking. So this isn't surprising because, I mean, we just, we define them this way, but just to show you what the data look like and to show you these learning curves, the sign tracking rate of learning is similar to the rate of learning of goal tracking. So when I was a postdoc with uh, Terry Robinson, I actually started collating all the data from anyone that was doing a sign tracker goal tracker study uh, in Terry Robinson's lab. So I would just start collecting the data. And after a couple of years ago, it, this was when he was doing a lot of sign tracker, goal tracker work. I collected data from, uh, not personally, some of these data I collected personally, but from anyone in the lab, uh, I, I, at the end I had data from about 1800 animals. And uh, I basically used those data to come up with a mathematical formula to define whether you could call a rat a sign tracker or a goal tracker. I won't go into the, the formula, but basically it's a normalized number that goes from negative one to positive one. If you have a negative one score, you're a perfect goal tracker and you never sign track. If you have a positive one, you're a perfect goal tracker or a sign tracker, excuse me. Um, and then this is showing you a frequency distribution of those 1800 animals that I looked at. You can see it's this bimodal uh, distribution where animals tend to aggregate towards the extremes although you do have some animals that do a little bit of both. And it's roughly a third of this population of animals that fit into each of these categories. Key points are that for both sign trackers and goal trackers, the cues predictive, learning occurs equally. So they are learning in response. The key thing is the nature of the response is different. For only sign trackers, um, is the cue attractive? Uh, the cues reinforcing, I didn't show you this, but if you do a condition reinforcement test, sign trackers will work harder for presentations of the lever compared to goal trackers, uh, even when there's no food around. Um, and then the cue reinstates reward seeking uh, in an operant paradigm. I'm not going to show you this for food, but I'll show you this for nicotine coming up. Now, why is this important? We actually conceptualize sign tracking and goal tracking as an index of a trait, kind of like, it's not really a personality trait, but it's a trait that we, that has the worst trait name ever because it's super long. Uh, the trait, we call it the tendency to attribute incentive value to reward cues. Um, so we think that this is, uh, 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 we conceptualize this as a trait because like other traits, it's heritable. Um, there's studies from Shelley Flagel at University of Michigan showing in inbred strains and selectively bred rats uh, that uh, uh, it's sign tracking, goal tracking is maintained from one generation to the next. I'm gonna show you some data from uh, a genome-wide association study that uh, we completed here at UB. Um, it's modified by uh, early, experiment, uh, early experience. Um, so there have been some studies showing that maternal deprivation enhances sign tracking. And I've also shown that environmental, uh, I have some unpublished data showing that environmental enrichment alters the rates of sign tracking as well. It's stable and predictive. I alluded to this already. You can predict condition reinforcement and reinstatement based on approach to the cue. Uh, you actually see similar uh, propensities in humans similar individual variability in response to reward associated cues in humans. Uh, last week, uh, we just had a talk about that uh, where uh, um, uh, 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 um, humans were placed in MRI scanners and being presented with uh, uh, drug and alcohol associated cues um, and looking at how that related to neural activation. Um, 
It's associated with biological differences. I'll touch on this um, if I have time at the end of the uh, at the end of the lecture. And then finally, it's associated with other traits in a predictable and logical way, including impulsivity, which I'm not going to talk about, but I have some publications on that, and responses to cocaine, which I'm also not going to talk about. What I am going to talk about is uh, uh, some of the nicotine self-administration study uh, that we've been doing in my lab. Uh, so those are the uh, uh, the two big things that I'm going to talk about now. So just to sort of set up the framework and organize the blitz of data that I'm about to show you, there's sort of two main categories of nicotine response uh, that I'm looking at, uh, sort of two different kinds of questions uh, that I'm going to tell you about. One is basically what I'm showing you here in this diagram is, is the response to food cues uh, related to the response to nicotine cues. So the, the general hypothesis is going to be, can you predict the response to nicotine based on who's a sign tracker and goal tracker? It's that simple. I'm going to show you some phenotype correlations, but also some of the genetic data. Then second, um, well, let's save that for later because I'll come back to that. Um, well, just to mention it briefly, second, I'm going to talk about whether nicotine actually alters the process of incentive value uh, attribution. Um, but I'll come back to that. And that's when I'll bring in Kajula's ideas. Um, uh, so this is a, a one experiment that I promised. This is actually just looking at the correlation between the response to food cues and nicotine associated cues. So the paradigm is basically simple. Uh, answering this question, do sign and goal trackers differ in the response uh, during nicotine self-administration? So we identified sign trackers and goal trackers using Pavlovian condition approach, and then we tested them in a nicotine self-administration paradigm. This is a standard nicotine self-administration. They nose poke for an intravenous infusion of 0.03 milligrams per kilogram per, uh, of, of nicotine. Um, and there, of note, there is a cue associated with that nicotine infusion. In this case, it's uh, one of those circular stimulus lights that are in the chamber. And so we basically looked at all phases of nicotine self-administration, acquisition, maintenance, extinction, and reinstatement. I'm just going to show you the maintenance and the cue-induced reinstatement here. So this is a study done by uh, um, uh, Cassie Versaggi, who's now at Roswell Park Cancer Research Institute in, in downtown Buffalo. Uh, first, she looked at sign trackers and goal trackers during maintenance of self-administration. What we did here is escalated the response requirement from an FR1 to an FR5 over several sessions. So a number of nose pokes for the nicotine, uh, uh, nicotine uh, reinforcers on the y-axis. Remember that they're also getting a cue at this time. Um, and then the session numbers on the x-axis. Uh, inactive uh, nose poke entries are on the bottom here, the triangles, and then the active nose poke entries are on the top. And here you can see that once you escalate the requirement to FR5, you get robust responding, um, and that is higher in sign trackers compared to goal trackers, although we do get some nonspecific increases in the inactive hole as well. This is uh, common when you use nose pokes. It's less common when you use levers. So it's hard to say whether this is specific for the nicotine reinforcer or not. But then we put them through extinction, bring them to a very low level of responding, no nicotine, no cues during extinction, and then we present them with the cue again. Uh, and here's what those findings look like. Uh, this is cue-induced reinstatement. So entries into either the active port in black or the inactive port in white, sign trackers, goal trackers, you can see that sign trackers engage in uh, cue-induced reinstatement uh, at a level twice as much as, as goal trackers. Um, so this supports that hypothesis that you can predict the response to a nicotine cue based on the response uh, to a food cue. Now, it, uh, like if you if you don't believe that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, I, I think, what to me is a pretty convincing uh, evidence from a genetic study that we're looking at, uh, that we looked at, um, sign tracking, that links these two behaviors using vastly different paradigms. So I have to give you just a little bit of background of the genetics. Uh, we're, in this experiment, we actually tested a different kind of rat uh, called heterogeneous stock rats. 
that uh, back in the 80s were bred from an eight-way cross of eight different inbred rat strains. Um, and basically how this works is you cross the rats on a rotational basis with the purpose of avoiding inbreeding. So you avoid uh, mating related individuals. Um, and basically what that results in is after several generations, uh, you have animals whose uh, genome, uh, these are supposed to be chromosomes here, sorry, I didn't specify that, whose genome is basically a mosaic of the alleles from the eight founding strains. Um, this is actually a little bit of a simplification. Now we're at generation 92, which means there's been a lot of recombination. So there's very small differences. Uh, 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 there's uh, very small regions of the genome where there uh, hasn't been any crossing over. What's the point that I'm trying to make here is that these are a really great mapping population. They allow you to map behaviors to very small regions of the genome. And I'm gonna show you uh, some of the candidate genes that we've identified using this process. Um, okay, uh, but just to point out that the Pavlovian condition approach that I'm about to show you is just one part of a larger part of the center that ended in 2019, although we did just get renewed. And so we're continuing this work now looking at some other traits. But I've been looking at Pavlovian condition approach at University at Buffalo. I do want to point out that they also looked at Pavlovian approach uh, condition approach at the University of Michigan. Uh, Terry Robinson and Shelley Flagel were doing that work uh, while I was doing this work with uh, Jerry Richards. Um, Jerry Richards is retired now and I've inherited his, his project. Uh, but I also want to point out that Hao Chen at, uh, at UTHSC um, has been doing nicotine self-administration. And he uses this really weird paradigm where animals are actually licking a flavor that's associated with a nicotine infusion. What's even weirder about it is the safety signal for that flavor is transferred from another uh, rat. So it's like the socially transferred nicotine self-administration. It's, it's a strange paradigm. It's, well, I, I guess I'm not being very really nice calling it strange. It's an, a non-traditional nicotine self-administration paradigm. And we also have transcriptomic data that Hao Chen collected from five different brain areas including the usual suspects, uh, um, the prefrontal cortex, the cumbens, and the habenula uh, that you're gonna hear about, I think in two weeks maybe. Um, so uh, just pointing that out, that we have data from all of these animals, um, but these are from different animals. So project one, project three, and project two, these are all uh, different sets of animals. That's important to remember as well. So here's what the data look like for sign tracking. This is called a Manhattan plot because it resembles the uh, Manhattan skyline. I guess this is more like a, a Dubai plot though. Um, what you see on the x-axis is basically a map of the genome. You've got chromosome one, it's the largest chromosome in the rat. Uh, and then you go all the way down to chromosome uh, 20, it's 20 chromosomes in the rat. Uh, so like this is the, the uh, one arm of chromosome one, and then this is the end of the other arm. So you have the whole region here. There's a map of the entire genome. On the y-axis is the strength of the correlation between the genetic variation in those areas of the genome and the trait. So in this, in this case, sign tracking. Uh, each of those, each of the dots that you see here is a particular Poly, genetic polymorphism. Uh, in fact, these are all single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these dots indicate the strength of those polymorphisms with the trait, in this case, sign tracking, goal tracking. So right away, you can see that there's a strong peak on chromosome one. Uh, uh, well, strong is a, a weird word to use there, a robust peak on chromosome one, um, indicating that there's something there on chromosome one that's influencing uh, very uh, phenotypic variability in sign tracking. So I'm going to show you the genes within this region, but before I do that, I, uh, I want to point out uh, this really interesting finding. One thing that you can do when you have a lot of data using multiple behavioral tests or multiple traits is you can do something called a phenome-wide association study. And this is basically where you ask the question, okay, I've identified a region of the genome that's, in, that's influencing one of my traits. What other traits does that region of the genome influence? 
And because you have this a priori hypothesis uh, uh, of my hypothesis is that this area on chromosome one influences other traits, it gives you a little bit more statistical power uh, to answer that question because you don't run into the pitfall of multiple comparisons. You're just asking about one particular genetic location as opposed to in a standard GWAS, you're asking that of every possible genetic location. Um, so this gives you a, a little bit more statistical power. So we did that. We asked, is this region on chromosome one related to impulsivity, cocaine CPP, response to novelty, nicotine self-administration? And so what you get is a really, really uh, boring table that's hard to parse, but just focus on this last column. Uh, this value D prime is a measure of the share of the influence of this particular region of chromosome one on these other, on these other traits. Uh, you can see a lot of these, the abbreviation here is Pavlovian condition approach. A lot of them are Pavlovian condition approach behaviors. So that's not surprising. But what's remarkable at the top of the list, when you sort by this D prime value, are these nicotine self-administration value, uh, nicotine self-administration measures. Day 20 of Hao Chen's procedure is his reinstatement day, is his Q-induced reinstatement day. Um, as measured by the ratio of active to inactive licks, remember they're licking a solution, uh, or just the raw active licks, you see that this region of, uh, of uh, the rat genome is influencing nicotine self-administration. This is really exciting because we identify this region not using nicotine self-administration. We use this, we identified this region using sign tracking and goal tracking, and we come out with this region also being involved in Q-induced reinstatement. Um, here's the GWAS for Q-induced reinstatement and how Chen study. Here you can see that we, uh, it is actually significant, uh, but barely. Uh, in fact, there's only one SNP that uh, uh, survives the correction for multiple comparisons, but because we can do this BWAS looking at multiple traits, uh, it does help us zero in onto this particular region. So what's in that region? This here on this graph is basically showing you a blow up of this peak uh, on chromosome one. So um, the, each of these dots here is a single nucleotide uh, polymorphism or an allele, if you will, that's associated with Q-induced nicotine uh, reinstatement. And you can see that there's a number of genes here that we're following up on. One particular uh, interesting candidate um, is DLG2, which is present at about 156 uh, megabase pairs on chromosome, um, excuse me, on chromosome one. Um, why is DLG2 interesting? Um, one, it's been identified in some other studies for addiction-related traits, including smoking. Um, uh, uh, so DLG2 is actually a part of the uh, postsynaptic density associated with excitatory glutamatergic synapses. Um, it encodes postsynaptic density 93, you've probably heard of it. It's a key protein involved in glutamate synapses, interacts with glutamate receptors. Um, this, uh, this PSD 93 is part of a network of genes that have been identified in transcriptomic studies from Bob, Bob Hitzman's group at uh, OHSU being involved in alcohol consumption in mice. And here's that network. And you can see that DLG2 is actually one of the hub genes that's important for regulating the activity of a number of related genes, including uh, glutamatergic uh, genes uh, on this map. Also, in humans, genome-wide association studies have identified DLG2 as a candidate gene for schizophrenia and COPD, which are both smoking-related traits. You all probably know that most schizophrenic smoke and COPD is obviously the obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Um, DLG2 has been identified in humans as well. And then finally, we actually have expression data from rats as well. There is a region uh, in chromosome one that actually regulates DLG2 expression. Uh, and we know that from RNA extracted uh, from the lateral habenula which again, you're gonna hear about more about the habenula, uh, particularly when Paul Kenny comes to talk uh, in your series. Uh, so uh, 
if you looked at the phenotypic correlation and you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I believe that, or maybe that's stochastic. Uh, I, I think there's some pretty strong evidence linking sign tracking and goal tracking with Q-induced nicotine reinstatement. One, because you see the phenotypic correlation. I've shown you that uh, some of the genes, uh, some of the same genes are uh, influencing uh, this trait. And in how Chen's self-administration and my self-administration experiments were done quite differently and still we're zeroing in uh, on the same uh, region of the genome. So I think that this is a, a, a real and interesting um, uh, uh, genetic finding that I'm looking forward to following up with um, in terms of manipulating gene expression pathways within this network that involves DLG2. Um, but you'll have to ask me back in a couple of years before I can tell that story. I want to tell one more story. Um, I, uh, about uh, about sign tracking, about the genetic basis of sign tracking and and and, uh, and nicotine self administration. But before I go forward, one is that I mentioned that uh, University of Michigan and us uh, and we at University of Buffalo are looking at Pavlovian condition approach in HS rats. But when I was a postdoc there, I actually talked Terry and Shelley into start collecting tails for DNA. Um, to potentially do a genetic analysis at some point. So, and they started doing that and continued to do that after I left. Um, and at, at the end, they ended up having uh, data from uh, about 3,200 Sprague Dolly rats. So if you combine all the animals, you get an enormous sample size, which gives you a lot of statistical power. Uh, at the end, they had uh, 6,406 rats, which is the largest genome-wide association study ever done in rats. Um, there, uh, this, uh, the analysis was done by Alex Gilletta, who's in Abraham Palmer's, was at the time in Abraham Palmer's lab at UCSD. I'm skipping the Manhattan plot and showing you the major finding, again on chromosome one, but a different part of chromosome one between 22 and 23 megabase pairs. That's uh, um, it contains a region that has a lot of these genes, you'll see here, these uh, TAR genes. What's TAR? It's the trace amine associated receptor. One, it's a cluster of genes. There's uh, some subtypes of the TAR genes. One of them is TAR1. You can't see it here on the list because there's so many TAR genes that uh, the program omits some of them, but TAR1 is one of the nine emitted genes. So uh, TAR1 is an interesting candidate because it's easy to follow up with, with behavioral pharmacology. Um, it's also been identified in the response to methamphetamine. This is actually my PhD advisor, Tamara Phillips, uh, that has done some work in mice identifying TAR1 as a candidate gene influencing methamphetamine drinking. Uh, and then just across campus is uh, uh, Junshu Lee, who's been studying TAR1, and he actually had in his lab uh, a TAR1 agonist. Um, and so we basically set out just to do a simple pharmacological verification of TAR1 being a gene that influences sign tracking and goal tracking. The drug is this drug RO5263397. It's a TAR1 agonist. So we basically tested the hypothesis, does this agonist alter the development of sign tracking and goal tracking? On the y-axis, uh, you're seeing the Pavlovian addition approach index, which I described before, uh, and then the number of sessions of testing. Uh, the black circles are the animals that got RL526, and you can see that the development of sign tracking is inhibited in these animals in the favor of goal tracking. Then we took the vehicle-treated animals and split them in half and asked, does this drug influence the expression of sign tracking? And it did. It reduced sign tracking but didn't have any effect on goal tracking. Maybe it increased it, but we just didn't have the statistical power because we divided the vehicle group in half, so we started to run out of animals. Um, but this is significant, showing a significant reduction of sign tracking uh, by this TAR1 agonist. And then you could hypothesize maybe sign trackers and goal trackers have different TAR1 levels. If that's true, they might be differentially sensitive to the response to a TAR1 agonist itself. TAR1 agonists actually cause a hypothermic response. And so we measured the hypothermic response in, in response to uh, uh, RO526 and sign trackers and goal trackers. And uh, goal trackers showed a more robust 
uh, hypothermic response, suggesting that sensitivity to TAR1 stimulation is correlated with the tendency uh, to sign track. So some behavioral pharmacologic, uh, pharmacologic uh, verification of TAR1 as an important candidate gene. So I'm really excited about this work because it leads you down you know, these pathways that you just didn't think you were gonna go. I had never thought I'd become a TAR1 person. I, I didn't even know what DLG2 was until I started doing this work. Uh, and now this is a direction that I might be taking uh, on my laboratory in upcoming years. So the second part uh, that uh, I mentioned already um, is looking at the effects of nicotine on the response uh, uh, to other cues. And so none of this is really gonna be that uh, uh, surprising uh, to this group. I've really sort of capitalized on, um, on, on Tony Kajula's idea that what nicotine is doing is enhancing the reinforcing efficacy of, of uh, other cues. And he has uh, some great studies in his uh, diaspora um, uh, of animal researchers across the, across the globe now. I have a, a, a lot of really interesting studies that have inspired me. But in 2009, he published this really inf influential paper, to me at least, and I think to a lot of people, uh, that he calls his dual reinforcement theory. Uh, I call it three, I think it's really three actions of nicotine, but basically what Kajula said is that, you know, nicotine is reinforcing alone, but not very reinforcing. It's a pretty weak reinforcer, um, uh, as we know from animal studies, and, and you know, Dr. Rose has a, a several analogous studies in humans showing the same effect. Nicotine is a weak reinforcing until you include uh, nicotine associated cues. What Kajula uh, pointed out in his 2009 paper is that the cues could be directly associated with nicotine. They could be paired with nicotine or not. Nicotine just has to be on board when animals are responding for a reinforcer that involves cues. So that's why, I, that's why I call it three actions of nicotine. Um, nicotine predictive cues acquire incentive value through Pavlovian mechanisms or through non-associative mechanisms as well. And I'll talk about some examples of each of these in the next eight minutes that I have. Um, so, but again, none of this will be uh, that surprising. Uh, this is one study just looking, showing you that Nicotine, oh, one thing that I will mention is you notice that I say incentive value here and not reinforcing efficacy. And I think that that's right. I'm trying to extend Kajula's idea from reinforcing efficacy to incentive value. And we can argue about that later if you want. Um, this is one study showing that if you just do Pavlovian conditioning, like I do in the lab, uh, a lever predicting an intravenous injection of nicotine, you get animals that will approach that cue. This is the time spent in the region of the lever. The animals don't bite it like they do with a food, uh, with a food reinforcer. They just approach it and sort of sniff it and check it out. So we have to torture undergraduates by getting them to score videos in order to get data like these showing that impaired animals, you get that increase and in approach to the cue, but in unpaired animals, you don't. This is the same data showing the same thing. This is latency. So lower numbers mean that they're approaching the lever faster. Now, uh, the, one of the first experiments I did when I started up my lab uh, was to directly test the Kajula effect, as we call it in the lab, um, uh, using a sign tracking goal tracking uh, paradigm. And so this actually helps us start to get at the idea of incentive value because one, it's in a Pavlovian paradigm. So the animals aren't responding for the cue. Um, so you have a lever that comes out into the cage and food pellets delivered into the food magazine. And then we just gave animals nicotine injections before they went into the chamber, subcutaneous nicotine injections. And you can see the data, you get an enhancement of sign tracking, no effect on goal tracking, and no effect in animals that get food uh, and the cue in an unpaired fashion. So as our definition of nicotine is in, uh, of, of, nic of uh, incentive salience enhancement is enhancement of um, approach to the reward associated cue. Here we're showing that nicotine in, uh, enhances that process. We've, we've also shown this for alcohol. Uh, in our lab, uh, rats don't really 
in most labs, rats don't really like alcohol, so you have to expose them in their home cage for about a month. So you're seeing that uh, here in this graph, animals increase their intake of alcohol and increase their preference uh, after several sessions. Um, this is work done by my postdoc and one of my graduate students. But then after we gave them that exposure, or not, we had some unexposed animals, we put them through alcohol Pavlovian condition approach. Did it a little bit differently. Here we had a control lever that didn't uh, predict an alcohol delivery, but the key here is that now you have a lever that's uh, predicting alcohol delivery into the, the, the food cup. Um, so if you look at sign tracking behavior, that's here on the top, you can see that nicotine enhanced sign tracking behavior in exposed animals, but not in animals that were not exposed to alcohol in the home cage. For goal tracking, this was surprising to us. Nicotine enhanced goal tracking as well. So it does seem like this enhancement of Pavlovian condition approach for an alcohol associated cue is not specific to sign tracking. Um, but what is interesting is that also enhanced goal tracking in animals that were never exposed to uh, alcohols. So we think that this might be unrelated to the, uh, the, um, the fact that it's an alcohol reinforcer. Now, um, I just I think I just got a couple more slides um, and, and then I'll take some questions. Um, so I've actually capitalized on this idea um, for my R01 that I, I'm working on now, um, basically based on the idea that what nicotine might be doing in terms of comorbidity, the use of alcohol and nicotine together, it, it's probably enhancing the incentive value of an alcohol associated cue. Even if it's not a specific effect of nicotine on alcohol cues, it's an effect of nicotine uh, on alcohol seeking. So we developed this paradigm that actually allows us to separate out the appetitive and consumption phases of, of alcohol drinking in animals. So basically what the animal has to do is respond into a nose poke port uh, for a 30 second presentation of an alcohol bottle. So there's an alcohol bottle behind the panel and extends into the cage. They got 30 seconds to drink as much as they can and then they can respond again for another reinforcer and then drink as much as they can. So we did the same sort of setup. We gave animals an injection of nicotine before they went in to go do this. And again, perhaps this is not surprising, but you see that nicotine enhances uh, self-administration of that alcohol uh, sipper bottle. Um, they're responding more for those alcohol deliveries. And again, it's really crucial to point out to you that there is this cue there and it's probably that nicotine, I mean, it is because when you remove the nicotine, when you remove this cue, the animals, you don't see this, um, this enhancement of self-administration. So that enhancement is due to the presence of alcohol associated cues. But when the animals are presented with the actual alcohol bottle, there's a lot of variability in the licking response, but we don't see any evidence of nicotine enhancing alcohol consumption in this paradigm. And in other paradigms, we actually see that nicotine reduces consumption at the same time uh, enhancing um, the appetitive actions. So making that distinction, I think is really important that nicotine might increase the motivation to acquire alcohol or alcohol associated cues, but once you actually have the alcohol in front of you, it does not increase consumption, at least not acutely. Uh, so this will be the last uh, experiment that I'll show. Uh, I mentioned when I was talking about Kajula, how you referred to it as the reinforcement enhancing effect. Of, of nicotine. And this is one of the major reasons why I think incentive value amplification is a better term. Um, so basically what we did in this study is we used a different kind of a cue. Instead of a, a cue that was response dependent, we presented a cue that indicates reinforcer availability. So you can imagine this uh, in like the human condition being a neon bar sign. Like when the sign is lit up, you know that alcohol is available, but when the sign is, is darkened, you know that no alcohol is available. So there's no point in you know, trying to get into a bar when it's closed. Um, that's sort of this paradigm here. We basically had 
two conditions that were signaled by a discriminative stimulus. The SD, which is the terminology for uh, um, a discriminative stimulus that signals reward availability, is uh, basically one of those circular lights, but it's on for a longer period of time, 7.5 minutes. Um, uh, that's my timer to tell me to wrap it up. Um, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, and the other, we had a different stimulus that's illuminated that signals reward non-availability. So what we, what we did in this paradigm is basically like I've just been talking about is give animals an injection of nicotine before they go into it. So first off, the animals do make the distinction between the SD and the S delta. They respond more when the SD is out and the last one it's not out. And then when you give them nicotine, we did a lot of other things with these animals, but on uh, day 32, we started giving them nicotine. Um, you can see that nicotine enhances responding uh, for alcohol um, it, when, uh, uh, when the discriminative stimulus is, is there, um, uh, when the SD is on, but doesn't enhance responding when the S delta is not there. So because the the stimulus in this case, the Q, is not response dependent. It's hard to call this reinforcement enhancing per se. Um, and we've seen this both during self-administration and during a reinstatement test. Uh, so we, we think that this is a, a good example where nicotine is having this more general effect that's not specific to reinforcement enhancement, um, but is uh, a more um, better characterized as incentive amplification. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. This is my summary, but I've said most of this already. There is a phenotypic and genotypic link between, um, between these behaviors. Nicotine can enhance responding for rewards by enhancing incentive amplification. I just talked about that. I do think that this has implica impl implications for humans, but I think that the nature of the cues in humans is probably much more complex and it's not associated with the alcohol itself, but probably more environment, social, complex uh, uh, cues that, uh, um, that uh, occur in human environments. Um, so I'll stop there. I did have some teasers about the neurobiology, but I knew I probably wasn't going to get to that. So I'll take any questions. Yeah, yeah. That, thanks, uh, Paul. That was just a really wonderful talk and uh, bridging the phenotypic, genotypic domains and the links between them. And, um, and it actually inspires me to, uh, to try to apply that to, um, to therapeutics, which I'm most interested in, in terms of helping smokers quit smoking or tobacco harm reduction, helping smokers switch to less harmful alternatives. And, and you're actually, it seems like you're very well poised to look at um, models of therapeutics in, in your situation. For example, uh, you know, the uh, would goal seeking rats be uh, suppress their nicotine self administration, uh, which includes cues and the nicotine, uh, better uh, if given a nicotine infusion that simulates, let's say, a nicotine patch compared to sign trackers whose behavior may not be suppressed by just getting the goal, so to speak, the nicotine alone. Uh, have you thought about, uh, you probably have. Or, or even your tar agonist approach, but actually looking at some models of therapeutics, can you suppress the behavior in the rats and show that different treatments uh, work better in the sign trackers versus goal seekers? Um, and uh, maybe that could be applied to tailoring uh, therapeutics in humans. Uh, yeah, the, um, the answer is yes, I, I do sort of, I, I do think about that a lot because that's sort of, you know, like, that's the main goal, right? Um, especially in terms of treatment. At least that's my my personal mission is to try to make some sort of an impact and to try to translate these results. I do want to, I and I never. It always. I always feel like I don't get this idea across very well when I give my presentations. But I, so I save it for the questions. Like I don't necessarily think that. Um, sign trackers are more addiction prone than goal trackers. And I think your question gets at this. Like sign trackers are particularly responsive to cues in terms of driving their drug taking behavior. 
But I might argue that depending on the drug class and depending on the individual, that the factors driving drug intake might be different. You might have smokers that are Q, you know, sort of like these sign, they, you might have sign tracking smokers that are particularly sensitive to cues. And so if you give them nicotine replacement therapy, you're still going to have those cues. You're still going to get nicotine enhancing the incentive value of those cues. And you're going to have less of an effective treatment outcome. But you might have a subpopulation of what I would call goal trackers that are less sensitive to cues. And if you provide them with a harm reduction therapy, like a nicotine, uh, uh, nicotine treatment therapy, um, nicotine replacement therapy, uh, that you uh, uh, that they actually would be responsive uh, to that because you are sort of you know uh, satis satisfying the acquisition of the goal because that's what they're oriented to. Now I have not done that with nicotine, but uh, there are some with cocaine. We do sort of show some of those effects. If you look at self-administration and maintenance of self-administration in that maintenance phase of animals taking cocaine, and you take away the cues, the sign trackers reduce their drug self-administration, which is what you would expect. They're dependent on cues for their drug self-administration. But the goal trackers keep going. They are less sensitive to the removal of cues. So I think that does sort of, it's an interesting sort of precision medicine perspective that you might want to spend time identifying subgroups of individuals that might be more responsive to particular types of, uh, of therapy in terms of preventing relapse. Exactly. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so nicotine has been shown in rats and, and people too, uh, to be an, an attentional enhancer, even absent the self-administration. Um, so how does this uh, property overlay um, the goal tracking and, and sign tracking and um, paradigm that, that you described? I mean, is it kind of just orthogonal to it or does it uh, uh, specifically apply to one or the other or both? Yeah, so I have been thinking uh, a lot about that. There's a guy at University of Michigan, uh, Martin Sarter, who uh, studies cholinergic systems and their involvement in attention. And he's done some work with sign trackers and goal trackers showing that sign trackers do have this sort of deficit in sustained attention. So this is when they're uh, you know, responding over long periods of time in the presence of distractors. Um, so it does suggest that there may be a role for the cholinergic system uh, and attentional deficits in some of these processes involved in drug taking, but I, I don't, I, I, there's not a lot of data. I have looked at some simple attention measures, um, like the choice reaction time task, where they have to watch for a stimulus and respond one way or the other. I don't see sign tracker and goal tracker differences there, but when you do make it harder, like Martin Sarter has, it does sort of reveal these differences in attention that could play a larger role, but I haven't delved that much into that using those more complicated techniques, but I'm definitely interested in doing that, particularly because the part I skipped over is that I'm interested in those basal forebrain systems in terms of their ability to modulate attention and incentive salience to reward associated cues. Because uh, that's, that's how I think nicotine is acting to alter sign tracking is by activating those basal forebrain cholinergic inputs into the insular cortex and other prefrontal areas. But that's, that's a new sort of direction that I'm going into now that I can't uh, say that much about right now. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, Jen, you have one more. Just one quick one. It's this is really kind of in, incredibly uh, detailed, but I just noticed on the slide of the transcriptomics where it it, it showed LHB looking at the RNA expression in the lateral habenula. Um, are, the, are you going to look, or your collaborator going to look at the medial habenula as well because that's got the highest density of nicotinic receptors in it, and it might be worth looking. Uh, at the medial as well as the lateral? Um, I have to check. When we started the, when we got the renewal um, for this project, 
they did uh, add some other brain areas, but I don't know if uh, the medial habenula was included in that. But let me bring that up with Hao, Hao Chen, who's uh, the only one without a name on the slide, um, to see, because uh, that, that is a good point. If there's a regional distribution of nicotinic receptors, we don't want to miss the, the lowest hanging fruit there. So thanks for bringing that up. Okay, well, thanks, Kip. Know. Such a such a great talk, and I, actually, we have a paper coming out about the uh, lateral hormonal and nicotine self administration. Um, anyway, we can talk later about that. But uh, okay. great talk, and uh, we're going to continue on in two weeks with uh, Britta Hahn, University of Maryland, who's going to speak to us about nicotine effects on brain function beyond dopamine. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Have a good. I know you all got to go. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks.